Let us join together now as a congregation in singing hymn number 40, For the Beauty of the Earth. Hymn number 40. Let's stand together as we sing. Good morning, friends. How are you today? You having a good morning? Well, we're going to do... What? I have all the drawers I had. That's awesome. We're going to do a little hand game this morning. Some of you may already know this, but for some of you it may be new. So I want you to take your hands, just like this. Spread your fingers out. Put them together, like this. Set, Set the fingers are inside. And then do this. Some of you may know this, but it goes like this. Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the doors. What do you see? All the people. Now, there's a second verse to this that I just learned, which I think is cool. Now, you can have a church without a steeple, but you cannot have a church without the people. I really like that second verse. I like it because it reminds us that we come here, we come to the church building. That, that's a lot of people, isn't it? Now we come, to, we come to this church building. It's a beautiful building. We have lots of room to, to play, to worship, to learn. But what makes it the church? Is it the bricks that make it the church? Yeah. Well, they make it a building, but I want you to look out there at all those people. They're what make it the church. They're the church. They're not a building. They're people, right? But together, they're the church. And you know who else is part of that church? You. Every single one of you is part of the church. So we come together. We come together in a building to worship and to learn about God. But what's important to remember is that we come together 
but all of us together make up the church. And you know what? I'm really glad that each of you is part of this church. I'm really glad that you are part of my family here. I hope you're glad too. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the church. We thank you for the people here who love us and that we love. Help us to continue to learn more about you and to share your love. In your name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the first epistle of Peter, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice and all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, Long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight, and like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, 
I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner. And a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, from whom all blessings flow, we have come into your presence this morning to worship and to praise your holy name. We thank you for the beauty of the earth, this wonderful place where you have placed us to live. You put us in charge of your creation, and so many times we have fallen short in our care of it. We pray that you will cause our minds and our hearts to dwell on you, most high God, and seek first your kingdom in all that we do. On this World Communion Sunday, we remember that night on which our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed and how he joined together with not only the one who would betray him, another who would deny him, and ten more who would hide in that upper room in the coming days when their entire world was falling apart, not sure where to turn after he died upon a Roman cross. In the coming moments when we take the bread and the cup, bring once again to our minds and our hearts the remembrance of the one who loved us so much in spite of our shortcomings and failures to bear our sins on that cross, to give his life that we might live. As we remember the great sacrifice of our Lord, let us remember from the words of the epistle that bears the name of the disciple who, de who denied him those three times, that Christ is the cornerstone on which his church is constructed, the rock on which our hope is built. Remind us, Lord, that our relationship with you is not just a private, individual thing, but a relationship with you as we are part of the people of God. A people, a congregation, a community that transcends denominational affiliations, national boundaries, and ethnic allegiances. Restore us into right relationship with you through the work of your Son, Jesus Christ. And help us, our God, to remember that even as bricks and mortar are placed together upon a cornerstone in the construction of a building, that it takes all of us. All of us working together, using our own individual spiritual gifts as your hands and your feet in a lost and dying world to help build your kingdom, both in this world in which we live and in the world to come. Bless our time of deacon election today. Bless not only those who will be called out to serve as deacons in the coming years, but also those who will continue to serve you through other ways. 
May all of these know of your love for them, our appreciation of them all. And call us all to faithful commitment as we seek to do your will together in our community of faith. Bless the one who will be coming to bring your message this morning. Speak through her that our ears may listen. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let's join together now as we sing our offertory hymn, number 690. We remember you. Hymn number 690. Again, let us stand as we sing. Pray with me, please. Dear Father, we do remember you. We remember your love. We remember your call. Dear Father, the Apostle Paul told the church in Corinth to be generous in all things so that through your generosity, others would give thanks to you. Dear Father, you have been so richly generous to us. We bring a portion of that back to you now. Please bless these tithes and offerings. Help them to be used for your service, Lord. In thy name, amen.
in the interest of full disclosure, since I am preaching a sermon about community and loving one another and bearing with one another, about 6.30 this morning a migraine started. I'm doing all right. I don't have the pain, but the medicine sure makes me jumpy. So I ask for your grace as I share with you this morning. Will you pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So how do you define yourself? Think about that for a second. Who are you? I'll go first. I am a child of God. I'm a wife. I'm a daughter. I'm a minister, I'm a friend. Did you notice something that each of those words had in common? Every single one of those words implies a relationship or a connection with someone. A relationship with God, a relationship with my husband, with my parents, with a congregation, with other people. You know, in fact, the more I think about it, it's pretty much impossible for me to declare who I am without indicating some sort of relationship. In the words of Parker Palmer, the question, who are you, goes hand in hand with whose are you? So who are you? And whose are you? Now, the answers each of you have will vary, but there is one thing that we all have in common. We are all children of God, and we're all doing our best to follow God, which means that we are not only connected to God, we are also connected to each other, united by that commonality in Christ. Whose are we? We are God's. And we are each other's. This morning, David read for us a passage from 1 Peter. Now, the letter of 1 Peter is a word of encouragement to a congregation that's undergoing some persecution. They feel alone, maybe scared. They're figuring out how to continue following Christ in their context. And throughout the letter, a key element to their perseverance is mentioned again and again. Each other. They're declared living stones being built together. A chosen race. A priesthood. A holy nation. A people. They are reminded that they are not alone. That they have and need each other. Now, it's a pretty good assumption that the audience for this letter was pretty diverse. There were both Gentile and Jewish Christians. And as a result, the fact that they together are called a chosen race and a holy nation is pretty significant. They're being declared a family. Now, we call ourselves a family of faith, so the novelty of such a word may not strike us right away. But imagine those words being read to a group of people from completely different backgrounds, who for most of their lives have identified themselves as being part of this group or that group. But now they are told, you, all of you together, are a people, God's people, a new family. Their participation in this group of believers has changed things. They belong not only to God, but to each other. They are a community. And they needed each other for support, for encouragement, for protection, accountability, and growth. And though it's a different time and a different place, that truth still remains. We need each other. We belong to each other. We don't exist in a vacuum. Our lives and our identities are informed and molded and shaped by those around us. 
We need to be connected to one another, particularly the body of Christ, for support, for encouragement, for protection, for accountability, for growth. So it's simple, right? Let's be a community. Let's do it. Simple, no problem. We got it, right? If only it was that easy. There's a passage in Acts 2 that describes another community, the first Christian community, as a group that had all things in common and spent time together and ate together with glad and generous hearts. And sometimes when I read that passage, I can almost envision the group sitting together and holding hands and singing kumbaya. It sounds so beautiful and peaceful, and I think, where's that church? I gotta be honest, I think they left a few details out. Now, later stories and acts outline specific disagreements that they had, but even in those early stages, I'm sure there were times that someone got miffed about something, someone had a complaint about dinner, or someone disagreed with how the money was being spent. We're humans, we are bound to disagree at some point. So the reality is, community is hard work. Building community doesn't happen instantly or overnight. We can't just say, we're a community now, and expect it to happen. It means commitment. It means responsibility. It means humility. It means risk. It means pulling up another chair to the table or even offering your chair to someone else. It means saying, I was wrong, and I'm sorry. It means offering grace and extending the hand of friendship. It means listening to one another, really listening to one another. It means making a safe space to share questions and doubts. It means sitting in silence beside a grieving friend. It means learning from one another, and in that process, allowing ourselves to be changed. It means wading through difficult and uncomfortable conversations and conflicts together, committed to see it through to the end. It means showing up for each other on the good days and the bad days. It means letting go of personal agendas and seeking to build each other up rather than ourselves. It means praying and eating and singing and playing and listening and serving together. It means acknowledging that you need those people around you. Because we do. We need each other. We belong to each other. So what happens? How do we let ourselves get in the way? A friend recently shared a quote with me that was from, of all places, Desperate Housewives. I really haven't seen the show before, but it's from a scene that involves preparing for a church talent show. And at one point, one of the characters looks at another and says, now remember, this is a church. They're going to be judging you. Now I laughed. But then I realized how painfully accurate that statement was. Us churchgoers, we tend to be a judgmental crowd. I mean, we don't mean to be. But did you see what she was wearing? And did you notice what time they finally got here? Did you hear what he said? Don't you know what kind of person she is? And don't even get me started on how many times he has missed Sunday school. When we let our judgmentalism get in the way, we're breaking community rather than building it up. We're drawing lines and boundaries, closing doors, and we're hurting the body of Christ in the process. Instead of pointing our fingers at others, what we're called to do as a community is to drop our masks. A few weeks ago, David preached about prayer and letting go of your mask before God. Well, when it comes to developing community, we have to let go of our masks with each other, too, which is downright scary. 
It means letting other people see that we may not have it all together, that our lives might be a little messy, that we don't have all the answers. It means being vulnerable with one another. And that's the key to being a community. And something beautiful happens when we allow ourselves to be vulnerable. The movie Freedom Riders tells the story of a Long Beach High School English class in the mid-90s. It's a time period when L.A. was dealing with race riots and violence. Now, in the movie, the school is just as divided as the city, with each group of students keeping to their own. Over the course of their freshman year, a rookie teacher, Erin Gruel, works hard to bring her diverse class together encouraging them to listen to one another, look past their family and gang allegiances, and recognize that they have more in common than they think. Now, the core of her teaching method is a diary for each student to allow them to tell their stories and know that they have stories worth telling. And as time goes on, the students start to realize that their stories are more connected than they first thought. There's a beautiful scene in the movie when at the beginning of their sophomore year, the class gathers to toast the future and declare how they will change and be different. Stories are told of realizing that they are worthy of respect, that they want to make it to graduation. But then a quiet student steps forward to read something from his diary. The rest of the class looks at each other. Who's this guy? Oh, wait, I remember him. He's been here, but I can't remember his name. He begins to read and tell the story of his family being evicted, of becoming homeless, of the guilt and fear and shame he felt in that as he came to school in last year's clothes, hoping no one would notice, and how he found a safe place in that room, in that class. He ends his story by declaring, when I come in this room, I know that I am home. And the other students gather around him to offer him hugs, handshakes, and support. Students that just a year prior were coming together to fight each other. That's being vulnerable. That's listening. That's community. That's who we're called to be, a place where we can walk in and say, I know here that I am home, and you're home too. And it doesn't mean wiping away differences. It doesn't mean that conflicts and disagreements don't exist. It means that the commitment to each other and the commonality is more powerful and more precious than what could divide. Do we dare to aspire to that? Do we dare to be vulnerable with each other? Do we dare to take off our masks in front of each other? Do we dare to lift up our imperfect souls together? Do we dare to do the hard and messy work of creating and being part of a community and continually opening that community to others? Do we dare to say that our connection through Christ is stronger than the pull to walk away from each other? I hope that answer is yes. I pray that it is. I'm committed to that idea, the idea that a congregation can be a community, that our congregation can be a community. But it's not enough for me to just stand up here and say so. These are questions we have to answer and work through together. The passage in 1 Peter compares that community, that coming together to building a house. And I love the image of community being a home. But this morning, I want to propose an additional metaphor, weaving. When we come together as a community, we allow ourselves to be woven together, our stories and our lives intersecting and overlapping. And it's messy, and it's difficult, and it's hard work that's never fully finished. But it's beautiful. Flora Winfield says it best in her poem, The Weavers. We have cooperated in this work, in this creation. 
Although we had no clear idea of what it would become, no vision of its design at the start, still we threaded the loom in risk, allowing one another to see our colors and patterns emerge as we wove the strands together. Common patterns shared and recognized and given honor, creating together a seamless garment of story, woven in one piece from top to bottom. An infinitely beautiful and varied cloak, colored with the clear and shining shades of our experience. And we have used it to dress the naked imperfections of our relationships and have been bound together in the necessary sharing of this creation. That's church, y'all. That's community. Today, we're celebrating communion. And since it's World Communion Sunday, we are celebrating with our brothers and sisters all over the globe, our international community. At communion, we retell the story of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. And we also claim the story that it is that story that unites us, that calls us into community, that invites us to weave our stories together and allow one another to see our colors and patterns emerge. At this time, I want our communion servers to come forward. And as they do, I want to share with you something we did at, a, at the 845 service. Many of you have probably noticed the chicken wire over here. I've noticed a lot of questioning marks. As part of the service this morning, we did a prayer weaving. As everyone came up for communion, they took crepe paper and wove it through. Symbolic of us as a community weaving ourselves together. Now, I'm not going to invite you to come forward right this minute and do it, but if you would like to at the end, you are welcome to come forward. Take crepe paper, there's plenty, and weave your part into the story we are telling together. A beautiful, complex, rich, kind of messy story. And we also, just as we will now, we took the bread and the cup, the symbols of the body and blood of Jesus, of the story of love and grace that binds and unites us as a community. This table is God's table, and all are welcome. It's where we tell the story of a meal that Jesus ate with his closest friends, with his community. And at that meal, he took bread and he blessed it, and he broke it. And then he passed it to them, saying, this bread is the body of life, broken for you. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we thank you for the beautiful mystery of your body, of your son, and for the privilege of being his body in our world today. Amen.